You're listening to Quantum Revolution with Karen Curry Parker, exploring new frontiers in consciousness, science, and evolution. Join us in intimate conversations with cutting edge scientists, spiritual leaders, artists, disruptors, and visionaries who are working towards reframing the narrative of our future by healing the rift between spirituality and science, reclaiming creativity, and laying the foundation for a new world. And now, here's your host, Karen Curry Parker. Welcome to the Quantum Revolution. We are living in a paradox. We are the manifestation of consciousness, pieces of the cosmos encased within bodies, ruled by a mind that creates the illusion that we are separate from the cosmos, individual events that will never be repeated again in the history of all that is. It's easy for us to think we are a dominion unto ourselves. And yet, this paradox invites us to explore that if we are holographic pieces of the cosmos, then the rules of the cosmos must apply to the unique and personal manifestation of the story that is our unique life, a theme we're exploring with many quantum revolutionaries this season. The cosmos isn't just free-flowing stuff floating around making up the contents of the universe. It's not space junk or a series of random events. Scientists know that the cosmos itself has a built-in bias in the program of how it operates. There are three organizing principles inherent in the bias of the program. Number one, the cosmos naturally moves towards higher and higher levels of complexity. We can call this evolution, so the cosmos is evolving. Number two, the cosmos is biased towards unity. The increasing complexity of the organization of the cosmos causes more and more cosmic events to be inextricably interconnected. And number three, the cosmos is biased towards coherence, not chaos, as so many of us have been taught. It is through chaos that we are reorganized towards coherence, a state where energies are aligned and functioning together at a high level. If we are aspects of the cosmos rolled into a human body that created the illusion of separateness, then we have to conclude that the organizing bias of the cosmos also then applies to us. This is the topic of this episode of the Quantum Revolution. We're talking with Dr. Irvin Laszlo, a philosopher and system scientist. He's published more than 101 books and over 400 articles and research papers. He's also been the subject of a one-hour PBS special, The Life of a Modern Day Genius. He is the founder and president of the international think tank, the Club of Budapest, and of the prestigious Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. The recipient of various honors and awards, including honorary PhDs from the United States, Canada, Finland, and Hungary, Laszlo received the Goya Award, the Japanese Peace Prize in 2001, the Assisi Mandir of Peace Prize in 2006, and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 and 2005. Today we're talking about his new book, The Wisdom Principles, a handbook of timeless truths and timely wisdom. Hi everyone, welcome to Quantum Revolution. I'm Karen Curry Parker and I am honored to have with us today Irvin Laszlo, who we have the pleasure of interviewing pretty much every season because he's one of the most prolific writers and global change agents that I know. And uh, every time we have the really the privilege of talking to him, I always walk away with my mind completely transformed and my hope restored, which is, I think, a, a beautiful part of the work that you bring. So welcome, Dr. Lasso. Nice to have you here with us today. Wonderful to be again here with you, Karen. We're going to be talking today about your newest book, which is just being published a small window before your next new book comes out. But we're going to be talking today about the dawn of an era of well-being. And I want to break down some of the core concepts that you cover in this book, because I think you do such a beautiful job of helping us understand why things like sustainability issues, climate change, wealth inequalities, breakdowns in social structures, the impact of artificial intelligence, and of course, even pandemics, why these major disruptive cataclysmic events are actually illustrating for us that we have an opportunity from this to create change on the planet. How do these destructive, stressful, frightening, 
unpredictable events herald the beginning of a new era? Because it's a learning process. Learning is not just something smooth. You just, somebody tells you something and you add it to what you have. If you really learn something, you are changing what you already know. Nothing is immune to real learning. Learning is disturbing your status quo. A pandemic and a global warming, the crisis of refugees and poverty and health and all that, these are all disturbances. They can lead to negative results, obviously. In the worst case scenario, they can lead to the end of humanity's adventure on the planet. But we mustn't forget that humanity is not passively receiving them. We are resonating with what goes on. And if you are conscious and feel ourselves being part of this world, part of humanity, then we will do something about it. We are conscious being. So I think really learning means changing, means perturbing what you have had, irritating, catalyzing. And that is what is happening with the, with the global crisis that you're having, that you just had. Because I think the main wave is perhaps over, except for the climate issues, which of course are continuing. But absolutely this great event of crisis is the womb of creativity and the womb of change. It could be positive change. It's up to us. So you said something that's very interesting. You said we are resonating with what's going on. Talk to me a minute about what does that mean? Well, this goes back to the new ideas of coming from quantum physics about you know, don't act on each other through brute force, uh, through energy that displays physical energy, vectorial energy. We act on each other by influencing each other subtly across the quantum field. And that effect is best described as a resonance effect. Basically, you ask, you ask yourself, what are we? And now we are getting into new, the new physics, the new cosmology. Because the answer is not material beings. We are wave patterns. We are figures in a common field, in the unified quantum field. We are patterns that were created and the last persist there and patterns that interact. And this interaction is not by brute force, it's by resonance. One thing, you say something, you are the way you are. When we talk to each other, when we are really are in contact with each other, then we resonate to what you are saying, what, what you are feeling, what you are being. So we can really live up to Gandhi's injunction, who said, be the change you want to see in the world. Just by being the change, we change the world. And that is, you know, a new effect, which we, which we have to learn, because we are not separate. As Einstein says, separateness is an illusion, which is brought forth by our everyday experience, but it's not the truth. Underneath it all, there is a unified field in which we are all resonating waves. So that sounds a bit far out. Uh, that's the idea of the new physics, of quantum physics. And it's probably as close to reality as we can get. So, so you talk about the, the quantum paradigm that's emerging in society. I want to unpack that a little bit, because I think, at least from my nominal observation, we're in between kind of two different worlds. We have this materialistic worldview that's still in place, that is kind of rooted in a very heavy way in maybe the misinterpretation of Darwin's evolution of the survival of the fittest. So it creates this, this idea that if we strive and fight and compete, whoever gets up on top wins, right? And you're saying, okay, we're moving into this new era. And in this new era, we have this metric, if you will, that is not so much about material value, but is the embodiment of well-being. And that to live from this place of well-being, collectively, we have to first be well. Is that a good way of summarizing that? Very good, very good, very good. It's not just I'm saying this about Darwin's theory. The new biologists are saying this. You know, listen to what Bruce Lipton is saying, for example, or Greg Braden, or Deepak Chopra, 
these are people who can translate the new insights that come in course in the quantum sciences, translate it into coherent and understandable concepts so we can all live this or resonate with. It's not the strongest, the most powerful, and the most aggressive that survives. Unfortunately, there is a kind of a day-to-day -day politics where that is still the case, where those who are the loudest and the most aggressive get to lead. But that is a bad way to go on. And there is a new wave coming whereby a critical mass, even people, a smaller groups of people, change the way they think and they change the world around them. I can say that there's an evolution not only of biology, the evolution of culture, our mindset, our worldview, and it evolves in tune with the world around us. Because if you are sensitive, if you pick up this information, if you resonate with it, we evolve in line with what is happening in the world. And with what is happening is underneath the noise, the chaos, the randomness, underneath there is a process. The process which we can find through the new sciences, through the natural sciences, from cosmology to, to, to even psychiatry, we find that what is happening is the increase in coherence, increasing in contact and communication, bringing with it an increase in solidarity, in compassion, in moving together as the positive aspect, ultimately expressed as love for each other, not for any conditional way. That's what do I get out of it? But because we feel ourselves becoming part of the world around us. It's an old, old feeling. William James, the great psychiatrist and philosopher, said, who wrote a book on the religious experience, he said the religious experience, and it's a more general way, any new, new genuine experience, is the experience of being part of something larger than we are. So there it is. I think this new communication this new inter-exchange that is, that is coming about between people and between people and the rest of this planet is auguring well for an evolution toward belonging, toward oneness, toward feeling ourselves part of each other, which is supported by the new sciences, by the quantum sciences, the new biology, the new psychology, just confirms what the ancients had known what the new quantum sciences now rediscover and what we learn when we learn it. We don't learn something new. We have an aha experience. We rediscover what we have known. Because sensitive people know that we are not separate. They know that we belong to each other, that ultimately we are at one with each other. I love that you qualify that for sensitive people because We've been talking on and off with all the different interviews we've been doing this season with people about what if anxiety is real? Meaning, what if what people are experiencing as anxiety is really their inner knowing that's saying, hey, the way we're living right now isn't in alignment with what we know is truth and it feels uncomfortable or wrong? We went off the wrong path. It's difficult to say since when. But certainly throughout the 20th century, especially in the second half already of the 20th century, we have gone off in an artificial path, trying to create the world around us in the image of our own wishes. Instead of aligning ourselves with it, we are creating an artificial world using the tremendous powers of technology, change everything around it. Everything becomes more and more synthetic, more and more artificial. People are removed from the world around them. Sometimes in big cities, people don't see a, a tree. They don't, can't we walk around, even though we are now being told that the walk around in nature, especially if you walk in barefoot, is a marvelous health effect. You know? What the Japanese call forest basing, getting into a forest. But we have forget, forgotten that. We are rediscovering it now. But over the past hundred years or so, increasingly we have created an artificial world which is, unfortunately, it's unsustainable. So we are using our technology to compensate for it, but in the process, we are destroying the integrity of the world around us. That's why we have climate change. That's why we have all these tremendous problems of the sea levels rising, it's, and sicknesses spreading, you know, viruses and other illnesses of civilization, of technology spreading. 
Not everything that we can do is a good thing to do. We have to learn that. Reconnecting to nature, reconnecting to what we truly are, that I think has to be our way forward. I love what you're saying. And and I think, you know, one of the things I keep, I, I have a 12 year old. So, you know, trying to hold a place for her to keep looking to the future with hope has been an interesting challenge because she's a very sensitive and extremely open hearted person. And uh, we've been talking a lot about how, yes, and, and this isn't any way downplaying anyone who's lost people during the pandemic because there's been so much loss. And yet the pandemic, I think, has brought to us a very important awareness that what happens, say, in China has the potential to impact the whole world. And because of that understanding, we are becoming more and more clear that we are a global community, not a, not communities of nations. And I have I keep telling her, we're going to find the solution to global warming. I really feel it. I know it. And yet we have to also look at the fact that global warming also has the potential to be a tremendously unifying event. We all live under the same sun. And so the same message of we're all together keeps showing up in the disruptions, not in a good way, if you will. I mean, it's still disruptive, but I can't help believe that underneath there, there's a lesson for us to look at in order for us to reframe our perspective so that we can continue to move towards the idea that we are united, we are connected, we are interconnected, interdependent, and inextricably interwoven into the fabric of the story of humanity. That's the message to give to your 12-year-old. That's the message to give to anybody who's willing to listen. Because indeed, we have now learning that we are all in the same boat. And we are also finding that this boat is leaking. And it's not enough to patch it up. We need a new boat. <laughs> That doesn't mean that we have to change all life on Earth. It means that we have to align ourselves with really with life on Earth and not go off in a, in a tangent which we think we just satisfy our short-term wants and then we're destroying in process the resources, the, the conditions under which we could thrive. So yes, we, uh, there is a cause for optimism. To have gone the way we have been going would have been the recipe for disaster. We're heading to a more and more crisis caused by technology, caused by human behavior, caused by our conflicts with each other in an ever more stressed environment. That is the worst way to go. So the alternative is to sit back for a moment, then act and think which way, how to go. And I would say go by connecting with the force. The force is evolution as it's inscribed in you and in me, in every quantum in, in, the, in the world. We are not indifferent, random happenings. We are evolving entities, becoming more and more coherent in the process. Coherence is growing on Earth, is growing in the universe, despite the superficial disturbances and the chaos and the confusion. It's still there. If you can align yourself with it, if you can resonate with the underlying oneness and coherence in the world, then you are the architect of a new world, of a better world. We can do it, but we must become sensitive to what we are and sensitive to how we pick up what is going on around us. We are learning that now, and that is a very positive and important factor. Very well said, very beautifully said. So I love I love that you say we have to be the change and you're you're advocating or you're saying we're entering into an era of well-being and I think you know, one of the, again one of the things I've heard many of the, the amazing thought leaders we've had this season say to us over and over again is we have to embody in your words the field of information that creates well-being so what is when people are saying, okay, I'm going to I'm going to become embodied expression of my well-being, what if they feel like that's selfish? And I'm just I'm saying this because there's so many sensitive people, I think, in our in our world who are trying so hard to fix everything because their hearts are aching that they forget to turn to themselves first. 
Do you have anything to say about that or any thoughts on that? Well, putting yourself first is a very dangerous and mistaken thing. Because that means you're disregarding what you truly are. You are a part of something larger, as we just said. You're part of this world of life on this planet. Putting oneself first, it means actually ignoring the effect of what that does to others around you, to other forms of life, other human beings, obviously. So I think what we need to do is understand that the whole is truly what we have to take care of. The whole system. If you take any one part of it, we are what is known in the system science as sub-optimizing it. You're not optimizing its benefits. You are just channeling it to one part. And that disrupts the wholeness of the system. Nature is whole. All things work together. A healthy organism is whole. We know that every cell, every organ must work together with every other if the organism is to be healthy. And if it doesn't, then the organ organism is sick, is ill. If that this detached part is begins to just look after its own interest, then we have a name for that. It's cancer. You know, health means wholeness. And thriving on, in the world means optimizing the whole system, which is the system of life. Seems very idealistic, but nothing less will do. And you know, for thousands of years, traditional cultures have not only known this, they've known it intuitively, but they've acted on it. They knew that they are part of their environment. The environment is not something they can sell, they can disturb or subvert as they want. They knew that to live with it is the right way. It's there in Christian teachings. It's there in, in, in Buddhism. It's there in the Chinese Tao. Wherever you look, you find the same message, basically. There is a whole wave of change, of evolution coming about based on love, based on belonging. And we need to be part of that. Then we can strive and we can be well. The Chinese concept of well-being is really a very good one. You can't have well-being for one unless there is a well-being for all, unless all are well. And that is true in the quantum sciences as well. You can't just do one thing. What you do affects others. And if you consciously affect others to their benefit, to the benefit of the whole, then you will benefit. This is the message for children. They know it. They intuitively, they know it. They sense it. We, we kind of educate it out of them by saying, yeah, you just have to just use everything to become wealthier, to become more powerful, to win in this world, because the losers are going down the drain, only the winners will survive. Completely wrong thing. The cooperative, the collaborative, the empathetic will win and they will survive and they will strive. So if we join them, we will strive. This is what I'd like to say. Enormous opportunity. Now that we know that we belong together, that we are all in the same boat, let's use this opportunity to become together and go with the force which is in us, which is a divine force, or the force of nature, the force of the cosmos, however you want to face it, is there. This is not an indifferent random universe. It's a wholeness, coherent, love-oriented universe that comes from the sciences and not just from poetry. Beautiful. That's so beautifully said. So I usually end with having my guests envision the world of the future, which you, you do that in every sentence that you speak. But if you want to end with just a vision of what you see as the potential fulfillment of the story of humanity, what does that look like to you? Well, I've actually tried to, to work that out, but it becomes a quite a little essay on working on the social and eco economic implications of that. Let me just say, the world that I would see is the world in which we are at home when we are where we are one, when we are one with others and with nature. We feel that, we know it, it's been now heavily substantiated by science, so let's act on it. The future world will not compete to the detriment of the competitor. The future world can have spirited competition, but if you all work toward the greater good of the whole, 
the whole system. We are wholeness-oriented being. We have forgotten that. We have become fragmented and disoriented from this wholeness and diverted away from it. It's time to come back. I think this awakening that is going on now, this questioning that children are doing, that sensitive young people, sensitive people of any age are increasingly doing questioning. Can we go on the way we have been going? Yes, go back, but not the way we have been going. Go back to something deeper and more natural. And that's going back to the integrity and wholeness, which is there in every leaf of grass. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you have several new books and one more coming out in January. We have The Wisdom Principles, A Handbook of Timeless Truth and Timely Wisdom. This is a great book that has wonderful, rich, deep, short chapters at the beginning that you'll need to take a week to think about each chapter. Uh, your new book, The Dawn of an Era of Well-Being. And your, what's your, your next book coming out in January? What is this one called? Yes, it's called The Upshift. Thriving on planet Earth. It's, it's a guide. It's meant to be a guide, a personal guide. How can you, each of us, each person who is now reading this or listening to this, how can you become a positive agent of change, leading to striving instead of conflict and decay? That's, and I'm trying to describe in about 150 pages or so. My task is that I'm still working on this. I'm trying to polish it to make it as clear as possible. We need a message that's understandable and that we can all acquire. Because not because we want to accept the authority, but because we feel that it resonates with us. It's something that we have known and it's now being spelled out. I'm just trying to spell it out. Thank you. You can find Irvin Laszlo's books on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere where, where you can buy a book online or in a bookstore if you go to bookstores these days. So as always, it has been just a tremendous, tremendous honor and a huge heart-opening, mind-expanding uh, conversation with you. And thank you so much for giving us your time and your wisdom and sharing with the world everything that you are and all that you know. Just really grateful to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Sharing is the key word, yes. We have to share whatever wisdom or information we possess, because together we can do it. And so let's get together, let's communicate. And you help me to communicate. Thanks for this great achievement. According to Dr. Laszlo, the purpose of life is one which manifests in two different ways. One of the manifestations of the purpose of life is the evolution of the actual body, the living organism that you are experiencing as you. And of course, the collective evolution of the human form over time. The evolution of the body is biased towards higher and higher forms and levels of coherence. The other manifestation of the purpose of life is the evolution of consciousness, of the mind associated with the living organism. This evolution is also towards higher and higher levels of oneness and more and more profound and encompassing forms of love. The matter-like and the mind-like evolutions unfold simultaneously. They're distinct, but not categorically separate. They are processes in the same universe. Chaos and disruption are merely symptoms of evolution and growth. We are no longer at a stage where we can pretend that we're not consciously responsible for our evolution. This is the tertiary paradox we are living in. The more we evolve, the more we are co-creators of our own evolution. We are facing a new opportunity to create a future of well-being. The future we desire is not some prophecy or prediction. The future we desire is the future we choose to create. If you'd like to learn more about your unique role in the evolution of the world, please visit www.quantumalignmentsystem.com. Thank you for joining me for this powerful episode of the Quantum Revolution. Thank you for joining us on Quantum Revolution with Karen Curry Parker. We hope you found this conversation inspiring. For more information on how to change your world and to hear more about our guest today, visit Quantum Revolution Podcast. Dot com. 
Make sure you follow us on your favorite podcasting platform so you don't miss a single episode of Quantum Revolution. We'll see you next time for some more groundbreaking conversations with Karen and her guests. How will you impact your world today?